This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us be glad and rejoice in it. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. For God has shown thee what is good. And what does the Lord require of thee but to do justly, to love mercy and to walk humbly with our God. Good morning. We welcome you this morning to the Andrew Rankin Memorial Chapel. And we pray God's blessings upon you as we seek to worship our God in spirit and in truth. This morning, we welcome to the Rankin Chapel the Right Reverend Marion Buddy, the Bishop of the Episcopal Diocese of Washington. Many of us remember that in June 2020, amid the George Floyd protests in Washington, D.C., Bishop Buddy criticized the use of tear gas by police and National Guard troops to clear the grounds of St. John's Episcopal Church for a presidential photo op. A message she said was antithetical to the teachings of Jesus. We give thanks for Bishop Buddy's courage and leadership. Pray for her now as she comes to share a message from our Lord. This week's scripture comes from Luke chapter 1, verses 26 through 38. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a town in Galilee called Nazareth to a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Greetings, favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was much perplexed by Gabriel's words and pondered what sort of greeting this might be. The angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And now you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give to him the throne of his ancestor David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Mary said to the angel, How can this be, since I am a virgin? The angel said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be holy. He will be called Son of God. And now your relative Elizabeth, in her old age, has also conceived a son. And this is the sixth month for her who has said to be barren for nothing will be impossible with God. Then Mary said, Here am I, the servant of the Lord. Let it be with me according to your word. Then the angel departed from her. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Your cares 
Let us prepare our hearts and minds for prayer. Let us be still before our God. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. You said, Lord, that if he just talked to you, that if he just let you know what we need, what worries us, what constrains us, we don't have to be anxious. You promised us a peace a peace that goes beyond anything we could ever imagine. Lord, we confess this morning that many of us are anxious. Anxious about many things. And we need your peace. We want to know that peace that will calm our restlessness. The peace that will cause us not to act out of our anger or our fears. A peace that will quiet and heal that which is bringing pain to our souls and confusion in our relationships. God, also our minds, O oh Lord. Protect us from our own thoughts from words, from memories. Whatever causes us to, to doubt ourselves and to doubt you. God, our hearts, Lord. Protect us even from feelings of loneliness and from whatever makes us afraid. 
then help us, oh God, to think about what is good and to think about what will be good rather than what we think about. Things of the past, circumstances that we cannot change. Help us, oh God, even in this moment to see the goodness that we too often take for granted. We pray now, oh God, for all who are hurting and, and all who need healing. Open now our hearts, oh God. Open our hearts to receive your healing. Heal now. Heal also our nation. Let your, your justice let your righteousness prevail. Come now, Lord. Come and hold us in your love. Hold us in your love until we learn how to love. Now drop thy still dues of quietness until all our striving cease. Take, Lord, from our souls the strain and the stress and let our ordered lives confess the beauty of thy peace. In your name we pray. Amen.
Grace to you and peace from God, our Creator, and our Lord Jesus Christ. Hello, I am Mary Ann Buddy, Bishop of the Episcopal Diocese of Washington, D.C., which also extends to four counties and Maryland. We are a church with roots going back to the colonial era and to slavery. If walls could talk, our churches would tell stories about tobacco farming and industrialization, of bondage in the name of the church and resistance to that bondage, of civil war, emancipation, the establishment of free black churches and schools for the education of the emancipated and support of HBCUs, of the growth of Washington, D.C. as a city where blacks and whites came in search of opportunity, of resegregation, Jim Crow, and the long struggle for civil rights, of the immigration of peoples from all over the world, notably West Africa, the Caribbean islands, and Central and South America. Some of our most inspired clergy and lay leaders have been and are Howard alumni and faculty. Howard University figures heavily in the story of the Episcopal Diocese of Washington, for which I give thanks to God. I also give thanks to God today for Dean Richardson, for the spiritual sustenance he offers daily for so many, and thank you, sir, for inviting me to speak. Thanks, too, to the chaplains, Chaplain Duffy, the administrators, student ministers of Rankin Chapel, and for allowing, allow me, please, an affectionate shout out to the Reverend Yolanda Roll, Episcopal chaplain at Howard. I thank God for your esteemed president, Dr. Wayne Frederick, the Board of Trustees, the faculty and staff for their visionary leadership and faithful service. I thank God for Howard alumni. And I thank God for you, Howard undergraduate and graduate students tuning in from wherever you are. I thank God for how you're persevering in your education through this season of disruption. We miss you here in Washington and look forward to the day when we can welcome all of you back. In the Episcopal congregations I oversee, there's a lot of Howard pride these days. There's always been good reason for that pride, but this month is historic. Dr. Frederick said it well. The vice president-elect has swung her Howard hammer and shattered the proverbial glass ceiling into pieces that will not be put back together. Amen and amen. And of her Howard experience, the vice president-elect has repeatedly said, that it was one of the most important influences of her life. Howard is a place, she's told the world, where you didn't have to be confined into the box of another person's choosing and where students were not just told we had the capacity to be great, we were challenged to live up to that potential. Howard was where she first ran for elected office, she said, as the freshman class representative of the Liberal Arts Student Council. So Howard, is where Kamala Harris's political career began. And every Alpha Kappa Alpha sister I know is bursting with pride, but so are all of the Divine Nine, for good reason. In this election, you encouraged record levels of voter engagement and turnout across the nation. In so doing, you helped protect our democracy and to face the urgent issues of our time. You recognized and acted upon this decisive moment in decisive ways. And so the title of my sermon today is Decisive Moments in Life and Faith, How We Learn to Be Brave. Now some people, I suppose, are born brave, but most of us must learn to be brave. And we all want to be brave when it counts. We want to be the one who steps up, who leans in, does the right thing when it matters most. We want to bring our best when we're called upon to speak with clarity and conviction in a pivotal situation. But how do we become that person? So when the moments come, we're ready. Well, I speak to you on what is in many Christian traditions, including mine, the first Sunday in the four week season of Advent. Advent is a time of anticipation and preparation that culminates on Christmas, the celebration of Jesus' birth, the coming of God in human form into our world. And Jesus is, as they say, the reason for the season. But today, consider with me the importance of one young woman's decisive moment, which made God's miracle possible. And in that moment, the angel Gabriel comes to Mary 
and announces that she has found favor with God, she is to bear the Christ child and give birth to him into the world. And at great risk and under the shadow of scandal, Mary chooses to be brave. She says yes. Not right away, mind you. She asked good questions first. How? How can this be? She pondered in her heart, as was her custom. She surely struggled in ways that we will never know. But when the angel assured her what we all long to hear in our decisive moments, that nothing is impossible with God, she says yes. And this wasn't a, okay, whatever kind of yes. This was a, here am I, servant of the Lord. Let it be with me according to your word. Yes. It was a decisive moment for her, for all of us. And she knew it. And while we may not have an angel come knocking on our door anytime soon, let me suggest that decisive moments like Mary's are part of our story too. And while the more dramatic ones seem to catch us by surprise, when we look at the wider lens of our lives, we see that our acts of bravery, the ones that astonish even us, are not isolated events. We have been prepared for them by all manner of decisive moments that came before. And what's more, how we live after those moments matter as much or more as the moments themselves. So I'd like to explore with you three different ways decisive moments come to us. There are more than three, to be sure, and these aren't the ones that make headlines, but they are the ones that teach us how to be brave, perhaps in preparation for the other more public moments when we will be needed and will need to be ready. Three decisive moments I place before you today are deciding to go, deciding to stay, deciding to start. First, deciding to go. Of the three, it's the most outwardly visible. There's no mistaking a decision to go as we physically move from one place to another. Internally, what it feels like is it's as if we're being summoned somehow. We don't fully understand why. And this summons to go somewhere, feeling guided toward a new horizon, teaches us that there's more at stake than what we can see on our own. My first conscious experience of this summons to go happened when I was 17. I'd been living uneasily and unhappily with my father and my stepmother and my younger half-brother. After years, though, of being afraid of my parents, I learned to stop thinking about them. And I focused instead all of my attention on the people of my church that I had joined on my own and on my high school friends, they became the family that mattered to me. But inevitably, my actual family fell apart. My father took me aside one day to tell me he was leaving, my stepmother, and he wanted me to go with him. And I didn't know then what clinical depression was in those days. I didn't know what alcoholism was, but I saw their manifestations in him, and there was no way I was going anywhere with my father alone. And for reasons I won't go into here, staying with my stepmother and younger brother wasn't an option either. So inside myself, I knew, I knew that I had to go, and I knew where. I had to go across the country to live with my mother, whom I had left as a child. Now, I knew my mother loved me, I loved her, but hear me, going there was the last thing my 17-year-old self wanted to do. Everything I loved about my life then was where I was was at school, and it was at my church, and it was with my friends. It was with a boy who finally seemed to notice me. And a lot of the adults in my life at the time were more than willing to help me stay so that I could finish high school where I was. The minister of my church and his wife even invited me to live with them, which I did for a few months. So if I'd been looking for external validation to stay, it was all around me. But you know, it didn't matter because the summons to go inside was that strong for reasons I couldn't understand or articulate. Now I'm 60 years old now, and I've experienced that same inner call to go many times since then, and I've learned when it happens to listen, in large part because I remember what it felt like 
when my life was in the balance as a teenager and I trusted for the first time in my life that voice inside and I realized then that a relationship with God isn't about having the correct beliefs but rather a willingness to trust, trust that voice and step out in faith. And that decision prepared me for other decisions equally hard in their time when I felt that same feeling, that same summons, that call and claim upon my life to go. And I don't know what that internal sense of summons has felt like or will feel like for you, but I, spe I suspect that you do or that you will. It's the voice of God speaking to you or, or think of it as your angel. And there'll be lots of times when other voices will clamor for your attention, wanting you to go this way or that, and times when you will tell yourself the things you want to hear. But the call from God, it feels different. It's not, it's not that your feelings or others aren't important to God. They are. But in the sense of that summons that precedes a truly decisive moment, how you and I feel isn't the most important data point, but rather what you hear, what I hear and sense from God. God is asking. So listen to that. Dare to be brave. And when the call comes, to go. Now, what's to go? Consider with me another kind of decisive moment. It's the experiential opposite of deciding to go. It's when we decide to stay right where we are. And because there's such drama and energy in going, it's easy to underestimate the importance of staying. But there, there's more than one way that we're called to be brave. And often, the most courageous decisions are the ones that no one else sees. My first great struggle with a call to stay came in the early years of my marriage and parenting and ordained ministry. Up until then, my life had been largely defined by going, moving from one place to the next, stepping out of one world and into another, choosing to be brave in the face of the unknown, all so exhilarating. And yet there I was now, I was in my early 30s, I was married, had a three-year-old and a newborn, I was working a full-time job that I was supposed to love, and there was a lot to love, which made it hard to talk about how trapped I felt in my own life. And my internal struggle then was a call to accept the parameters and limitations of my life and to go deep, not to run, but to stay. And this has been a recurring theme in my life. Whenever I wrestle with that call to stay where I am, and slowly over time I've learned that faithfulness isn't always about taking those big leaps, but walking with small faithful steps. And I've come to realize that those who make a real difference in the air communities and in the world are the ones who stay in one place long enough to bring about lasting change. You know, there's a story in the Bible about a time in Jesus' ministry when he was just becoming controversial, controversial enough that the crowds no longer followed him and the ranks of his critics were growing. And in a private conversation, he gathers the 12 and asks them, and remember, these are those closest to him, and he asks them if they also want to go away. And Peter spoke up for the group and he said, Lord, where would we go? We believe that you have the words of eternal life. They had come too far to turn back or to go somewhere else. They were staying put. They were staying with him to the end. Deciding to stay, however, doesn't always feel like a choice. It can come in the wake of a disappointment when doors close instead of open, or others are chosen instead of us. Deciding to say can feel like a failure, and sometimes failure and disappointment are necessary. Or in the mystery of grace, they are actually nurturing the soil in which the seed of a new possibility is being planted. And the gift of the decisive moment to stay can be an opportunity to tend to our character and skills, to savor grace in small packages, and to learn how to Reckon with the struggle instead of to run with it, run from it, and to persevere. And again, these are the times when God speaks deep within, giving you courage to make a difficult choice or a freeing choice from that sense of gall. The Benedictine nun, Joan Chittister, put it this way, it may be the neighborhood you live in rather than the neighborhood you want. That's your true home. It may be the job that you have rather than the position you're pining for. 
that will set you free. Or as I once heard Pastor Mark Batterson from National Community Church say, listen, but if it isn't Jesus calling you out onto the water, better to stay in the boat. Sometimes saying yes to where we are is the brave choice. Okay, deciding to go, deciding to say, and lastly now, deciding to start. Now you know as well as I, for example, that the civil rights movement didn't begin with Dr. King's I Have a Dream speech in 1963 or with the Montgomery bus boycott in 1955 for that matter. Nor did Kamala Harris's journey to the vice presidency have its beginnings when she walked onto the stage, but it actually began right here as when she was a freshman at Howard over 30 years ago. The journey toward justice, the journey toward our destiny is long, but it begins when we decide to start and then keep on deciding each step of the way. I often return to the moment in Jesus' life when, as the Gospel of Luke tells us, he set his face toward Jerusalem. It was a decisive moment for him. And he began the long walk from his hometown of Nazareth and the towns and villages around the Sea of Galilee where his movement began. And he gathered strength, and he set his gaze now toward the seat of religious and political power. He needed to be there. So he set his face and he began the journey step by step. What's interesting as you read along is that a life along the way didn't look that much different from before. He continued to teach, to heal, to mentor his closest disciples, but the destination now was always before him and it informed every step he took. Now, in my experience, this first step of deciding to start has often come out of the disappointment and a decision to stay. And in the regrouping and the reimagining of my life, sometimes a new vision emerges, but one that requires patience and preparation and training. And the decisive question was, was I willing to begin a journey toward a future that remained elusive and not a sure bet? And that sense of call again, that summons, the guidance from within is what propels us forward. It's harder to sustain over time, but it's so important. Perseverance is the hidden virtue behind every decisive moment, and in particular, these decisions to start and then keep going, step by step, as we fall down, get back up, as we get thrown off course, redirect and start again. So don't give up. Trust that the initial impulse that got you going in the first place is still true, even on the days when you don't feel it. Deciding to go, deciding to stay, deciding to start, and then keep going. These are the moments that teach us how to listen to that inner voice, that inner compass that guides us, carries us, prepares us, perhaps, for other moments when we're called to step up or speak out. But rarely, if ever, do we walk onto the public stage with no preparation. God prepares us through a lifetime smaller yet equally decisive moments when we listen, listen for that summons to go, when we dare to listen and to stay, when we realize the journey is long and so we start and we start again. And through them, God invites you and me into the kind of relationship that teaches us, teaches us to trust what we hear and to live according to what we hear from God. So. In your decisive moments, large and small, public or private, I ask you, please trust that inner wisdom, the strength, the power, and the grace to guide you. That is your angel calling, beckoning you to be brave and yes, like Mary, to say yes. Yes to stay, yes to go, yes to continue forward on a future, toward a future that is your destiny. God bless you and keep you faithful step by step on the way. Amen.
What a powerful message. Though the physical doors of the chapel are closed, the chapel remains open and vibrant as we continue to support the entire Howard University community. And we need your financial contributions. To support the ministry of the chapel, visit our website, chapel.howard.edu. There you will find a give link. And in this time of uncertainty, never forget the power of prayer. You may submit prayer requests via the chapel website as well. Join us tomorrow at 7 p.m. for this semester's last installment of the Communal Conversation series, A Different World. Howard students will discuss the overall impact of the COVID-19 pandemic and social unrest on their physical, mental, and spiritual well-being. We will go live from YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter. So bring your questions and an open heart as these students share their experiences and hope for the new challenges that they face. To stay updated on all things Chapel, follow us on social media, Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook with the handle at Howard U Chapel. Take a moment now to subscribe to our YouTube page and like us on Facebook. Lastly, wherever you're worshiping with us, share your worship experience using the hashtag Sundays are for Chapel. We now welcome Dean Richardson, who will lead us in our benediction. We thank you, Bishop Buddy, for that very powerful and moving message. Let us prepare our hearts and minds for the benediction. We thank you, O oh God, for what eyes have seen, our ears have heard, and our hearts have felt. And now I said to the one who stood at the gate, give me a light that I may go out into the darkness and into the unknown. And she replied to me, go out into the darkness, go out into the unknown, but put your hand in the hand of God, and God shall be for you better than light and much safer than a known way. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and give you peace both now and forevermore. Amen.